Hi everybody, welcome to lecture 10 of Electrical Engineering 331. In this lecture we will continue our discussion of convolution. So the first thing I want to do is to show you something that's uh, good news. And so let's let's see what we're talking about. Okay, so we asked the question, what happens if we convolve the delta function, this delta of t, with some other function? Well, um, we could think of this, an example we could think of would be convolving delta of t with h of t. You know, h of t is the impulse response of a function. Of a, excuse me, impulse response of a system. But we know from the convolution formula that if we take x of t and convolve it with h of t, then we get the response of the system to x of t. And that's true for any x of t. So, if we have delta of t convolved with h of t, we must get the response to delta of t. But the response to delta of t, you know, delta of t is the impulse, so the response to the impulse is the impulse response, which is h of t. So that means that delta of t convolved with h of t is simply h of t. Well, is this true in general? Let's, let's look and see. <clears throat> so we'll see if this works for a general function, f of t. So delta of t convolved with f of t, plugging into the convolution uh, formula, that's equal to the integral from negative infinity to infinity of delta of tau f of t minus tau d tau. And remember that when you integrate um, you have an integral like this, you just look at where the um, argument of the delta function goes to zero, and that's at tau equals zero, and then evaluate the rest of the integrand at that point. So when we evaluate the rest of the integrand, which is simply f of t minus tau, when we evaluate that at tau equals zero, what do we get? f of t. So indeed, we conclude that delta of t convolved with f of t is f of t. So that's good news there because that means that the uh, convolutions involving the delta function uh, look like they're going to be really simple. But, but what if we have delta of t minus t naught? Uh, how would that affect things? Well, again, let's plug it into the convolution formula, delta of t minus t naught, convolved with f of t. According to the convolution formula, that's the integral from negative infinity to infinity of delta of tau minus t naught times f of t minus tau d tau. And so to evaluate this, now what I'm doing here, this u substitution, is really not necessary. You could just use the same principle we had before and say, okay, what value of tau will make the argument go to zero? And obviously the answer is t naught. And so evaluate the rest of the integrand at, at tau equals t naught. And so we get f of t minus t naught. But if you don't like doing it that way, this is another alternative. We could let u equal tau minus t naught, which is the argument right there. And so then du would be equal to d tau. And then the uh, when we check the limits, when, when tau is negative infinity, since u is equal to tau minus t naught, uh, when tau is negative infinity, u will be negative infinity. When tau is positive infinity, u will be positive infinity. The delta of tau minus t naught becomes delta of u. And the f of t minus tau since tau is now equal to u plus, you know, just solve this equation for tau and you get tau is equal to u plus t naught. So this would be f of t minus u plus t naught. And then d tau is du. And so um, um, now I've just rewritten the argument of this f function and now we can use directly 
our uh, now you know the fact that when u is equal to zero that makes the argument of the delta function go to zero and so that's where we want to evaluate the rest of the integrand so we evaluate that at u equals zero and we get f of t minus t naught so either way you look at it like you say you could have you could have just used that same reasoning up here once again the way you would think about it is what value of tau will make this argument go to zero well it's tau equal t naught so evaluate at tau equals t naught here and we get f of t minus t naught so we that's much more direct and that's a, a better way to do it really but if you are uh, more accustomed to thinking of just having um, a single variable as the argument of the delta function this is how you could accomplish that but i would encourage you to try to get comfortable with um, doing what we did up here okay so but either way you look at it you find out that delta of t minus t naught convolved with f of t is equal to f of t minus t naught and of course this is a more general formula than what we uh, derived before because it would it would uh, this uh, result that we obtained uh, right here is just um, a special case when t naught is equal to zero of this more general formula so this is the this is certainly a better formula for you to remember right here and it's quite a really it's it's um, um, it would be hard for me to stress too much how nice that formula is it um, you know because convolutions as you've already seen convolutions can be sort of uh, tedious to evaluate but this is um, extremely easy so like I say here, the delta function is your friend. You may have never heard of the delta function before this course, and it may have struck you as something sort of odd, maybe even something to be avoided, but that's not the case at all. The delta function is something very nice to see. <clears throat> okay. So now I want to look at some um, more examples of convolution in, in uh today's lecture uh, we won't cover um, well we'll cover one sort of new idea but for the most part we're just getting more practice with convolution okay so the first thing I want to do is to reconsider problem one of test nine you know in that uh, problem we were told that um, the step response of a system and also the the input to a system are both given by this graph right here so uh, if this graph indicates both the input to a system and also the step response to a system then what is the response to this input what is y of t this is this is x of t so what is y of t okay well in lecture 9 the way that we solved this problem was as follows we said okay x of t is equal to u of t minus u of t minus 1 and so y of t is the response to x of t so it's the response to u of t minus the response of u of t minus 1. In other words, y of t is equal to y step of t minus y step of t minus 1. And then we proceeded from there because this graph tells us what y step of t is. And so we found y step of t and then we plugged into this formula to get y of t okay but and and we've already done this but now I want to challenge you and I want you to th try to think of an entirely new way to solve this problem and I'll say can you think of what that way is and I will give you a hint 
it involves convolution. It involves this convolution formula, y of t is equal to h of t convolved with x of t. Now, I strongly encourage you, stop the video now and try to think about that for a moment. How are we going to use that formula? I mean, let me point out to you, we don't know h of t. What we know about the system is just these two things. We know y step of t and x of t. But for this formula, we need to have h of t and x of t. So what do we do? Turn off the video for a minute and think about it. And um, if you can figure out what, what to do, then certainly go ahead and try it. But um, when you, you know, either finish or you hit a stumbling block, then come back to the video. Okay, well, the key is this. We need h of t. As we said, we know y step of t and x of t. But we need to remember, so, so it says here, you might be wondering how we can use this formula when we don't have h of t. But we do have y step of t. And remember, since delta of t is du dt, now this is something I hope that you're beginning to really get accustomed to thinking of and something you don't have to look up. This is something you really need to have in your memory. The delta function is the derivative of the step. The step is the derivative of the ramp. You need to have that firmly in your memory. But since it's true that the delta function is the derivative of the step, then the response to the delta function is the derivative of the response to the step. And the response to the delta function, of course, is h of t. So h of t is the derivative of the response to the step function. Or in other words, the derivative of y step of t. h of t is dy step of t dt. So we have information about y step. So therefore, we can take the derivative of that to get h of t, and then once we have h of t, we can convolve it with the given x of t to solve the problem. So let's see how this goes. Okay, y step of t is u of t minus u of t minus 1, and we've just said that h of t is the derivative of that, so it's the derivative of u of t minus u of t minus 1. And, and, and again, now, as I said, I hope you're getting used to thinking of the derivative of the step as the delta function. So h of t is just delta of t minus delta of t minus 1. And this is great, because now we're going to convolve h of t with x of t, and we said, oh, we, we like to do convolutions with the delta function. So let's see how it will go. We have y of t is equal to h of t convolved with x of t. We just found out that h of t is delta of t minus delta of t minus 1. And then we're going to convolve that with x of t. And so that gives us delta of t convolved with x of t minus delta of t minus 1 convolved with x of t. And now we use our property that we learned just above. That delta of t minus t naught convolved with f of t is f of t minus t naught. So, delta of t convolved with x of t is x of t. Delta of t minus 1 convolved with x of t is x of t minus 1. So we have x of t minus x of t minus 1. And remember, x of t is simply u of t minus u of t minus 1. So we plug in that for x of t. And then for x of t minus 1, we plug in the same thing, but with t replaced by t minus 1. So this t becomes t minus 1, and this t minus 1 becomes t minus 2. And then when we expand this all out, we get y of t is equal to u of t minus 2u of t minus 1. 
plus u of t minus 2. And that is the same result that we obtained in test 9, but, but using an entirely different method. And I think you will agree that, that this method is really a lot easier. I mean, notice we never did have to explicitly calculate any integrals at all. So this is really nice. Okay, now let's look at another example. This is a problem. Um, we've looked at some different parts of this problem 2.5 in your book before. We've looked at uh, part C and part D. Now let's look at part A. So it says that, uh, again, I, my step of t is this, as it is for all parts of problem 2.5. But in part a, we're looking at this input, x of t is equal to this function. And we're supposed to find y of t. So uh, try to do this first using the method of lecture 9. Now, really, again, I very strongly encourage you, stop the video and really try to do this yourselves using that method that we learned in Lecture 9. And then uh, once you have either finished or you've hit a, a you know, a, <laughs> a block or whatever, then come back and, and, and see what we do together. Okay. Well, I hope that all of you had good luck with this problem. Uh, let's uh, look and see how it will go. Okay. Again, x of t is given right here. And that's equal to u of t minus u of t minus 2. So y of t, which is the response to x of t, will be the response to u of t minus the response to u of t minus 2. So y of t is y step of t minus y step of t minus 2. And I'm going to put an asterisk by that because we'll need to refer to it a little bit later. But up here in this other graph, we see that y step of t, and, and we've done this in uh, when we've looked at this problem before, because like I say, for all parts of the problem, we use this same value for y step of t. And so as we have seen in previous problems, y step of t for, for, for problem 2.5 is um, r of t minus 2 r of t minus 1 plus r of t minus 2. So that means then that y of t is equal to y step of t. So that's here's r of t you can see we've just copied this down exactly. This is y step of t minus, and here's the same function, y step, but of t minus 2. So we just replace all the t's by t minus 2 to get this. And then when we um, go ahead and expand on this out, we'll get a r of t minus 2r of t minus 1. Here we have a plus r of t minus 2 there and a minus r of t minus 2 there, so we don't have to worry about that. Then we have minus a minus, so we have plus 2r of t minus 3 and then minus r of t minus 4. So for problem 2.5a, if we use the method of lecture 9, this is what we find for y of t. And I hope that that's what you uh, determined yourself. So now <clears throat> what we want to do is to go back and do that same problem, but now using the convolution technique. Okay. So like I say here, now try to do this using the convolution formula. And again, just like uh, above, you're not given h of t, but you can find h of t by taking the derivative of y step. So 
see if you can do this. See if you can take the derivative of y step and then convolve it with x of t here to get y of t. And the y of t that we should be getting is uh, this function right here. Or, or if we get that, that's fine because we know uh, once we get this formula, we know that what, we know what y step of t is. So then we immediately get this formula. So see if you can get uh, one of these two formulas. And and I'll go ahead and admit that this is a little bit uh, tough, but try your best. See what you can do, and then come back to the video. Okay. Well, let's see how you did. As we said, um, since we don't have h of t, we must find it using the formula that h of t is dy step of t dt. Okay? So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to say then that y of t, instead of uh, writing it as h of t convolved with x of t, I'm going to go ahead and substitute in dy step of t dt for h. So we have this formula for y of t. And now if we plug that in um, to how the convolution is defined, then that's dy step of tau d tau times x of t minus tau d tau. Now, if you got this far and then you tried to proceed past this point, uh, you might have concluded that this problem was pretty tedious. But if you're very, very observant, then certainly don't worry if you didn't see this. I, I really doubt that many people uh, saw this at all. But I just want to point it out to you. I don't expect you to be able to see something like this, but it's very interesting if you do, and it makes the problem a whole lot simpler. But if you were very alert you're going to notice the following. See, in this formula, we have the derivative on y step, and we also have x. Now let's come up here again and look at y step and x. Here's y step, and here's x. So if we take the derivative of y step, well, y step, <coughs> you know, we have it right here. It has these ramp functions in it. So when we take the derivative of y step, we're going to get um, u functions. We're going to get step functions. And so if we just blindly go ahead and we take the derivative of this and then multiply it by this, we're going to get step functions multiplied by step functions. And as I say, that's going to be a little bit tedious. But the thing that you might, if you, if you were very alert, you might think, well, wow, it would really be nice <clears throat> if the derivative, instead of being on the y, fun y step function, if the derivative were over here on the x function instead, that would be really nice. Because this, the x function is u of t minus u of t minus 2. So the derivative of x is just delta of t minus delta of t minus 2. And we've learned that we like convolutions with the delta function. So it sure would be nice, coming back down here again, it sure would be nice here if this derivative were on the x rather than on the y step function. And that thought might make you think, hey, what about using integration by parts? Now again, um, I've seen problems like this lots and lots of times. And so I think about that, and you haven't seen problems like this that many times. So if you didn't think of that, don't worry about it. But I just want to show you how easy it makes things if you do happen to try that. Okay? So, again, if you are very alert, you will notice that it would be nice if the derivative was on x rather than on y step, because then we would have our friend the delta function. 
So this makes you think of integration by parts. And I'm just reminding you of the integration by parts formula. The integral from A to B of U dV is equal to UV evaluated from A to B minus the integral of V du from A to B. So looking up here at this integral that I want to evaluate, I'm going to say u of tau is equal to x of t minus tau. u of tau is this part. And then dv is going to be the rest. Oops, I should have said dy step of tau d tau. And then I left out that d tau. So let me fix that. I'm going to stop for just a moment and put a d tau there. So wait just a second. I'll be right back. Okay, so now it's there. So, let's see then. Um, in order to evaluate this then, uh, we're going to have to find uh, U. Okay, we have U. Then we're going to have to find DU, so we'll do that here. And we need to find V, so we're going to have to integrate this. So let's see how this goes. If U of tau is X of T minus tau, then DU... Now, remember, we're taking derivative with respect to tau. So by the chain rule, this tells us, you know, the derivative of, of, of x of t minus tau will be negative of the derivative. Um, so we're going to, uh, so we get uh, negative d, dx d tau evaluated at t minus tau. And then we have this differential d tau. And um, over here, if dv is dy step d tau, d tau, then when we integrate that, we get just v of tau is y step of tau. So now we're ready to uh, plug everything into the integration by parts formula. And we get y of t equals this integral from negative infinity to infinity of x of t minus tau dy step of tau d tau d tau is equal to, okay, here's u v from a to b minus the integral of v du from a to b. Okay, now let's see how this goes. At the upper limit, uh, tau equals infinity, we have x of t minus infinity, so we have x of negative infinity times y step of positive infinity minus, at the lower limit, when tau is equal to negative infinity, we'll have t minus a negative infinity or t plus infinity, so we have x of positive infinity times y step of negative infinity. And then for the integral, we have um, minus, minus is positive, and then we'll have integral negative infinity to infinity, y step of tau, and then this dx d tau evaluated at t minus tau, well remember, x here's your x of t it's u of t minus u of t minus 2. So dx dt is delta of t minus delta of t minus 2. Or x of tau will be delta of tau minus delta of tau minus 2. And so um, dx d tau... Let me, let me say that again. I think I said one thing incorrectly there, so let me start over. X of t is u of t minus u of t minus 2. So dx dt is delta of t minus delta of t minus 2. Or dx dt of tau is delta of tau minus delta of tau minus 2. Okay, that's dx d tau now if dx d tau evaluated at tau was delta of tau 
minus delta of tau minus 2, then dx d tau evaluated at t minus tau will be delta of t minus tau minus delta of t minus tau minus 2. So that's how we get this expression right here. It's just by looking at the graph above, keeping in mind that our uh, argument is not t, but is tau, and then evaluating actually at t minus tau. So that's how we get this expression right here. And now we're finally ready to evaluate this. Now notice that at negative infinity, x is 0. Uh, and at positive infinity, x is 0. Likewise, although it's not necessary to observe this, y, at po y step at positive infinity is 0. Y step at negative infinity is 0. So all of this goes away. And then looking over here at this integral, it just gives us y step of t minus y step of t minus 2. Because uh, tau equals t will make the first one go to zero. So that's where we get the y step of t. And then the second term will go, the, the argument will go to zero when tau is equal to t minus 2. So we just get y step of t minus y step of t minus 2. That's what y of t is equal to. And if you notice, that's exactly, that exactly matches what we had above right there so we don't need to go any further because we know then that we would immediately just by doing this substitution we would get this same result so the conclusion is then that if if and it's a big if but if you were very alert and uh, saw this possibility of converting uh, using integration by parts then you could do this integral uh, pretty quickly. You have you certainly have to be careful with it, but you can do it pretty quickly. <clears throat> but now to finish this lecture, I want to see how you would do this convolution if you didn't see that trick. Okay. So we're going to say how would you do this integral? right here. This is y of t. We've already said that this is what y of t is equal to in this case. How would you do this integral if you did not see that trick? So that's what we're going to come down here and we're going to say, but suppose now that you didn't see the trick with integrating by parts. So how do we evaluate y of t is equal to h of t convolved with x of t, which is dy step of t uh, dt convolved with x of t in this case without using that trick? Okay? So um, if you haven't tried this already, I hope that you will, will uh, stop now and try <clears throat> and then come back and see if you agree with uh, what I do. Okay, so now to finish this lecture, we have we are trying to evaluate uh, this directly. Okay, so we have dy step of t dt convolved with x of t, and uh, we said above that y step of t is r of t minus two r of t minus one plus r of t minus two. And we said that x of t is u of t minus u of t minus 2. And so when we take the derivative of this first, remember the derivative of the ramp is the step. So the derivative of r of t is u of t. The derivative of r of t minus 1 is u of t minus 1. Bring down the negative 2. And the derivative of r of t minus 2 is u of t minus 2. And then we're going to convolve that with u of t minus u of t minus 2. Now, when we expand everything out, we will get uh, u of t convolved with u of t minus u of t convolved with u of t minus 2. Um, and then we'll have a, and remember that uh, in convolution we can change the order. So minus 2 u of t minus 1 convolved with u of t could be written as minus 2 u of t convolved with u of t minus 1. And then uh, the 
the minus 2 u of t minus 1 convolved with uh, minus u of t minus 2 would give us um, plus 2 u of t minus 1 convolved with u of t minus 2. And then the uh, u of t minus 2 convolved with u of t is the same thing as u of t convolved with u of t minus 2. Again, we've uh, switched the order. And then finally, u of t minus 2 convolved with minus u of t minus 2 is minus uh, u of t minus 2 convolved with u of t minus 2. Okay, now if you look at that carefully, you notice that the second term here um, will cancel out with the second from last term. And so we get y of t is equal to u of t convolved with u of t minus 2 u of t convolved with u of t minus 1 plus 2 u of t minus 1 convolved with u of t minus 2 minus u of t minus 2 convolved with u of t minus 2. And I'm going to put two asterisks by that because I want to refer to this equation later. Now, as I say here, this possibly looks very tedious. And in fact, if you tried to turn the crank and do everything here individually, it would indeed be tedious. And um, fortunately, we're going to, in the next lecture, learn a, a considerably easier way to do that. But for right now, there is at least one thing we can do to make this better. And it's the following. Let's make the observation that all of these terms have the form u of t minus a convolved with u of t minus b, where both a and b are greater than or equal to zero, and b is greater than or equal to a. That's the way that I've arranged all of these. Okay, so let's see if we can come up with some general formula. You know, this, this formula right here, let's try to evaluate that and then apply the result to all of these so we don't have to do each one separately. Okay, so, <clears throat> so that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna say, can we evaluate u of t minus a involved with u of t minus b. It's not too hard, so I encourage you, once again, stop the video, try this yourself first. Okay, so I hope that you were able to make some progress with that, but let's do it all together now and see what happens. So u of t minus a involved with u of t minus b is the integral negative infinity to infinity. Uh, in, in the first uh, expression, we'll replace t by tau, and in the second expression, we replace t by t minus tau. And so that's how we get u of tau minus a, u of t minus tau minus b, d tau. Okay? And, um, and, and going from here to this next term, it's just a very minor change. I just uh, really interchanged the order of the b and the tau in here. So I have t minus b minus tau. And... I put parentheses there, that doesn't change anything, it just maybe help you concentrate a little bit more, see things in a slightly different way. But those parentheses right in here could be removed if they don't, they don't really do anything. Okay, well, the first thing that we will do, we have, this is like a, a number of the integrals that we've been doing lately, where we have two u functions in the integrand, and we want to uh, see how we can simplify this integral. So let's start here with this second u function. We have u of t minus b minus tau. And, and keep in mind now that tau <coughs> is the integral, uh, is the variable of integration. So when you think about this, when tau gets bigger than t minus b, u goes to zero. But when tau is less than t minus b, then this term is just equal to one. So we can rewrite this integral in this way. Again, the part of the integral where tau is greater than t minus b, we just drop that off. Because when tau is greater than t minus b, 
this term is zero. <clears throat> but when tau is less than t minus b, then this is equal to one, and so we don't have to write it down. And so the integral becomes this. And now let's think about that. Now this u of tau minus a, well, we know how this goes. When tau is greater than a is equal to one, and when tau is less than a is equal to zero. So, if a <clears throat> is greater than t minus b, then in this whole range from negative infinity to t minus b, this argument is going to be negative and therefore u will be equal to zero and we will get zero. So the integral is equal to zero <clears throat> if a is greater than t minus b. Because we never get up to that point a where the unit set function will turn on. But on the other hand, if a is less than t minus b, then okay, we don't have to worry about values of tau from negative infinity up to a because, again, if, if tau is, is less than a, the argument is negative and this function is zero. So the lower limit, we don't have to go all the way back to negative infinity. We can just start at tau equals a. And of course, we already have the upper limit is t minus b. And as long as tau is in that range between a uh, and t minus b, then, well, actually, as long as tau is greater than a, then this function here will be equal to one. So we have, um, uh, oh, and, and like I say, that will be the case if a is less than t minus b. Okay. So let's see. Um, this is really pretty simple now. The zero comes down and uh, this uh, restriction comes down. And when we integrate one d tau, we get tau from the lower limit to the upper limit, and then bring this restriction down. And then um, uh, bring down the zero. And um, when we evaluate at the upper limit, we get t minus b, and subtract what we have at the lower limit, which is a. So we have t minus b minus a. And I'm gonna rewrite this. I'm gonna bring the b over to the other side. And so I have, if a plus b is greater than t, and again, here I'll take uh, b over to the other side, and so I'll have a plus b is less than t. And then I'm going to make one last uh, little change here. Um, instead of writing, I'm going to, okay, I'll write the zero as zero, but t minus b minus a, I will write as t minus the quantity a plus b. And uh, I'm just going to change, I'm just going to flip this here. Instead of writing it as a plus b greater than t, I'll write it as t less than a plus b, and here I'll write that. Uh, instead of writing a plus b is less than t, I'll write t greater than a plus b. But now, if you look at this expression on the right-hand side, you see that's just the same thing <clears throat> as t minus the quantity a plus b times u of t minus the quantity a plus b. Just that simple. And that, again, is u of t minus a involved with u of t minus b. So it wasn't too terribly hard to get to evaluate this general formula. And so now we're going to be able to finish up this problem pretty easily. Remember that what we wanted, what we had up here, this equation double star, right up here, we had, that's, that's our y function, but we have to evaluate all these convolutions. So I'm going to write that down here. That's what we have. 
but now I'm going to use this formula to evaluate all those convolutions. Now comparing this with the formula, in the first one we have a is 0 and b is 0. Uh, for this second one, it looks like that. If we have a is 0 and b is 1, in this case a is 1 and b is 2, and in the last case a is 2 and b is 2. So a is 0, b is 0 there, a is 0, b is 1 there, a is 1, b is 2 there, a is 2, b is 2 there. And notice that all of our results depend on the quantity a plus b. So I'll go ahead and evaluate here in the first case, since a is 0 and b is 0, a plus b is 0. In the second case, since a is 0 and b is 1, a plus b is 1. In the third case, since a is 1 and b is 2, a plus b is 3. And finally, in the last case, since a is 2 and b is 2, a plus b is 4. And so now that we have all of that, we are ready to evaluate or simplify now this y of t using this formula over and over and plugging in for a plus b. So in the first case, a plus b is 0. So this just becomes t minus 0 times u of t minus 0, or t u of t, minus 2. And then in this case, a plus b is 1. So we have t minus 1, u of t minus 1. And then bring down plus 2. And for this term, a plus b is 3. So we have t minus 3, u of t minus 3. And then bring down this minus sign. And here a plus b is 4. So we have t minus 4, u of t minus 4. And finally, remember that t u of t is r of t. So y of t is equal to r of t minus 2r of t minus 1 plus 2r of t minus 3 minus r of t minus 4. And that is exactly the same result that we obtained right up here. And that was, you know, using the method from lecture nine. So the convolution method is indeed giving us the same answers, but it's much more general because, again, the method of uh, Lecture 9 depends on your ability to write the input that you have in terms of singularity functions. But you're not going to always be able to do that. And the convolution method works for any input. So that's why it's so important. But as we said, you know, as we've seen here, the evaluation of these convolutions can be sort of tough. Now we had one example in test nine um, where, let, let's just look at it real quickly. Problem two on test nine, we were convolving these two signals, and that was pretty easy. Problem three, we were convolving this signal with itself, and that was a little more difficult, but it was still a whole lot simpler than what we just did here in lecture 10. So, um, so convolution can be easy sometimes, but often it can be pretty involved. And so the good news is that in lecture 11, we will begin to learn an easier way to do some 
of these convolution problems. And it's, it's a graphical technique. So that's what we have to look forward to next time. But that concludes uh, this lecture. And so um, uh, I'll talk to you soon.